Hola niños, this is Pain from Young Justice Legacy, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized Uncle Walker D01. Recognized Dungeon Commander D45. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we are joined by DC, aka the Dungeon Commander. DC is the creator of the brilliant role playing game Mutants in the Night and is a must hear voice in the gaming community. You can also find DC as the host of their own Twitch stream and on the Star Trek Adventures on Roll20 with even more projects coming soon that apparently we're not allowed to talk about that I just <laughs> heard rumors of. Stay tuned for that. Mutants in the Night is a near-future superhero RPG where mutants are shunned to heavily fortified safe zones to placate humanity's fear of the unknown. Mutants in the Night is a game that explores what it means to fight back against a system that's rigged against you. To quote the website, the law stands against them, Enforcers stand above them, and opportunity stands before them. DC, we are honored to welcome you to Weld. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, up to and including episode 13 of season 3, the comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So, DC, I touched on a few things in the intro, but could you tell us a little bit more about kind of who you are and what you do in the world? Yeah, um, I'm a tabletop RPG designer. I'm a part-time streamer. I'm also a community manager. All of this came from uh, the last year and three or four months ago where I jumped back into making my own content, which hasn't been a thing for a long time. And... Immediately, I just had a feeling of what I wanted to create and the kind of experiences that I wanted to have within a community and by getting to know other people and having a lot in common with uh, their goals and meeting the great, really inspiring like mentors and older publishers and designers in the community really helped change my idea of I'm going to make this small little thing into I can go as far as I can with this and let's see how far that is along that way. I made a discord community has over 400 members now, really great people. We try and make it so that it's inclusive, but also really safe for different marginalized groups. And we stick strongly to that. I've met some amazing people from that and on Twitter and have just been popping off ever since there's been a lot of, Great design stuff going on, and uh, I've come out with another game recently. And so, I, I want to dig into this a little bit more. Like, what is your origin story with gaming? You said you came back into it. It sounded like you were implying that you came back into gaming and back into design. Were you designing before, or were you like <laughs> were you like most of us? And pretty much any time you're sitting at an RPG table, you're designing because you want to house rule stuff left and right? Or was this something you were professionally doing? It came back. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, I wasn't designing on a professional level. I had always be been interested in narrative design as a kid. I didn't know that's what it was called. And what happened with me was what happens with most people is I was playing tabletop role-playing games and I was homebrewing stuff. But uh, I played a lot of D&D &D growing up and one thing about me that I don't know that people know is that I've never played a D and D adventure in my life. I didn't really know they were a thing okay. because you mean like a, like a module you mean yeah, like, a pre, a, like a pre, like a pre, like a pre-written game. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Not one. Um, <laughs> because the, the family that I played with, they created their own stories. And so that's just how I thought it was done. And I didn't know until a few years in that, those even existed, but I didn't even think that they were like a core aspect of the game. I was like, Oh, cool. Old documents. And anyways. And so, um, the first time that I GM would it was with a world that I created. And I had also hacked the game 
and homebrewed some stuff into it with like on top of your classes, you had like a job class as well. Like you could be a mechanic and a pilot and all this other kind of stuff. I love it. And I did not know the actual rules very well, but it didn't seem to matter as my, my players had a great time. And ever since then, there was a period of time where I wasn't playing because uh, I played 3.0 and 3.5. Right. And then I just wasn't playing when 4.0 came out. And when 5.0 was being spoken about, uh, it caught my interest and eventually some of my friends were playing and they, they brought me back into it. There were small campaigns and talks along the way, but uh, what really even got me into thinking about design was a friend of mine who designs multiple hacks and games, card games, RPGs. He's uh, an absolutely brilliant person that I've been trying to kind of rope into the community, um, but he's very busy in his own life. So when I had an opportunity after talking to him and like, kind of getting an idea of how it's done and seeing that I, I lined up with like the way that he understands game design. I gave it my own shot and just took off. So mutants in the night is not a fifth edition or D 20 hack. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I got to <laughs> So what did you do to start with? Like, did, well, this is, is, is this your first, project period or just like your first major project it's my first major project project there was i think two or three months before mutants i made a D D 5e class and i made four D D 5e races and a friend of mine who was helping out made one and we did those because i was playing in a DD campaign at the time i yeah. wanted to start taking some of the issues that D and D has with representation of marginalized people and, and change it. And yeah. that's what the core of like that supplement was. And the class was just, I want to do something wild. And so I made a, like a potion crafting class and um, you had a, a blow dart gun to shoot potions into people Yep, and a whole wild list of things that you could create and how to, how to get parts for the different potions that you have. It was, I might return to it one day. It was a really cool idea. That sounds fantastic. And actually, there's some parallels there because I designed a, the Alchemist for 5th edition uh, is one of my best known supplements as well. And uh, I, I discuss about reskinning things like the delivery. Like, it, yes, this is technically a spell, right, from the book. We call them formulas. But like the, mm. po the poisoner tends to deliver, deliver these quote unquote spells however they can, whether it's powder blown in somebody's face or a blow dart gun. And, and we, I, I talk about make this your own, you know, reskin this just because it's, you know, just because it says that it's a spell that requires, you know, finger waggling and arcane magic. Don't, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if the, if the game mechanics are the same, own it, make it personal for your character, describe it in those ways. It sounds like I'd be fascinated by this potion class. So I want to, I want to see it. It, it. You said this was a supplement. Now you put this together. Was this something you had up on like drive through RPG or was this just a project you were working at at home? It's on DM's Guild. Uh, oh, is it? Okay. The, the, it's the Shaman class. And Wait, what? It's a Shaman class? Yeah, there's actually some divination stuff as well. Uh, we gotta, uh, we gotta talk, man. <laughs> like that, 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 that's my jam. Like I didn't know any of this stuff about you. Actually, I've been working on a Shaman class in my head for a very long time because I, I am actually a practicing shamanistic. That's my spirituality. And so bringing that, in, bringing that into um, gaming is important to me as appropriate representation as well. Uh, we need to talk about other things. So, but uh, we're going to talk about all that <laughs> another time, I think. But we definitely, I would definitely send us a link to the DMs Guild and we'll put that in the show notes as well. Cool. So, so that was your first step. D&D 5th &D, edition. It's an easy way for people to get into it. Particularly early on, there wasn't a lot of supplemental material. So it was, it was a, actually a very helpful vacuum for a lot of designers, including myself, to be able to jump in and, and have a fairly popular role-playing game, you know, ride that, ride that wave and get your kind of feet wet in pro development. But how did that get to Mutants in the Night? Because Mutants in the Night has, when I think of reading and I think of game design, particularly with game design, the key thing that's the most important thing I think about game design is understanding what feeling am I trying to invoke or evoke in my players? What, what, where, what store, where am I trying to take them? And where D and D is is a fairly general open game, anywhere from kicking doors down and fighting monsters to 
you know, some pretty deep emotional things. The game mechanics don't necessarily lean into the storytelling aspects, right? Mutants in the Night <laughs> is not that. <laughs> <laughs> Mutants in the Night uh, is something that I, I heard about, uh, I read in, in the intro, and I think uh, I'm not going to be alone when I read that, and I think, I want this, I want to experience this. I don't want to just play this game, I want to experience what it is that this designer is trying to share with me. So how do you get from, you know, a few new races slash species for D&D and then moving into Mutants in the Night? It was a pretty quick transition as after I created those races, which I thought were really fun and interesting, I realized that what I was trying to do was start from the bottom of a mountain and try and climb all the way up. And so there are a lot of things in D&D that I would change and that, like, I would prefer to be different. I was like, rather than trying to work inside of someone else's world, I can just create my own so that every piece of it works towards what I'm trying to say. So for a while, I was just very lost. And I was very much on Twitter and speaking to people and just by chance ran into Avery Adler. Brilliant designer. Yes, absolutely. And it turned out like it was serendipitous because I did not know that she was a game designer when we originally interacted. <laughs> she was talking about the prison industrial complex and I was just like, oh, I'm totally on board with this. Right, right. For those of you said, because of course our, our, uh, we do talk about role-playing games a lot on Whelmed, which is because we have so many RPG industry people who, who are involved with the podcast. But for those of you who don't know, Avery Adler has designed some of the cornerstone storytelling focused games over the last few years and she is absolutely brilliant so just to keep that if i had met if i had met her I, i'm glad i would not have needed i would have needed to take a breath i'm kind of glad for you you didn't know that she was who she was when you met her because i think i'd have been i'd have been nervous <laughs> yeah it turned into it was really interesting because i did not read read any of avery's work actually for until a couple months ago once I, I found out, once right. I realized at the time, because I was like, if I, if I see now, uh, about a year ago, I was like, if I see what it looks like to be all that way ahead, it will intimidate me and make me feel like I can't get there. Yeah. Because I didn't see all the steps. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, Avery is great at conveying, Hey, what do you need? And I can give you some leads. Yes. And it's not like a forceful pushing or anything. And so we have a lot of similar feelings and ideas I found as I began to design and was like, oh, Avery made that in some capacity or like was thinking in the same area. Right, so, right. So uh, she became an absolutely fantastic mentor for me and led me to Powered by the Apocalypse Games. And once I saw, I, I listened to a couple of podcasts like Daniel Kwan's podcast to help me understand that uh, how to work with the concepts of dealing with marginalized representation and colonialism mm -hmm. and then daniel kwan's podcast is asians represent on the one shot yes. podcast network is also brilliant daniel kwan and i just happen to be huge fans of one another and when we met it was just phew, oh we're best friends i guess just yeah right off the well field. deserved on both fronts um we'll put links to that in the show notes as well so so you kind of stepped into a room full of incredible designers and supportive individuals right off the bat. So very quickly, well done. It was a lot of luck. And, uh, mm. when I found, well, I was recommended to blades in the dark. I saw what the system did. This is, this is the actual, this is like the, the talent thing, uh, that comes into it because all the rest of it is just hard work and luck as, all the industry stuff. Yeah, so but, I'm, I'm going to, I have to say it, uh, luck is uh, preparedness meets opportunity. And you were prepared, and you got the opportunity, and you, you didn't let that opportunity pass, and you, you, did, you did the work. So um, Blades in the Dark, for those who don't know, is also another role-playing game that is, is excellent, that has some mechanics that uh, are fantastic for it in what it does, but also I often see now hacked into other, other role-playing games because of its innovative nature. Mm -hmm. And so you ran into Blades in the Dark and continue from there. And I decided this is the game that I want to hack because I was like, I don't know anything about systems except for D&D. &D, I know that. Right. But I'm stepping into this new field, so I'm not going to tackle that. This system 
it does something very specific, and that is capture the process of a human going through stress and trauma. Yes. And that is the core of st struggle, like the human experience and struggle. And so it's like, that's, that's what I need. I wrote up a, I called it a narrative design hack where I was like, this is a new setting. Right. You can play it in. And I was like, I'm done. And <laughs> <laughs> you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was so wrong. <sighs> I put it out there and people were like, this is really cool, but what about this? And what about that? And et cetera. Yeah. And so I was like, wait, I want, I want people to have powers because I come from big surprise, the uh, <laughs> superhero background. Right. Um, I was raised mostly on Marvel. And then as I got older, I started to get more into DC as the way that I see it is I always say that DC has better characters and Marvel has better like arcs like stories right right that's changed kind of over the years but right etc that's how i felt about it growing up and so i have always been into those stories and what the characters are really about and you you take these characters that are that are massively powerful and it's like oh well they can face the entire world mm -hmm. and then you look into their lives and it's like wow they are just dealing with it like yeah. it's Nothing has changed between being a human and being a, <laughs> yes. a, a superpowered alien. It's the same thing, you know? You still have the same struggles. This is, uh, and this is, this is why I wanted to have you on the show. And when we were talking about the exact topic we we're going to talk about, this feeds in exactly into that. Um, but before we get into that, I do want to find out when did you first see Young Justice? Did you see it in its original run? Did you watch it on Netflix digitally? What's your story there? I watched it on Netflix. My friend who is like, I don't, I don't know if this is a common experience, but I have like a friend who's like trusted in the recommendation of comics. Oh yeah. I know. I get it. Yeah. Everyone's like, Oh, read this and read that. And I'm like, no, I don't trust you. Uh, <laughs> like I love you, but I don't trust you. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. There's that one friend who's like, yo, you need to read this. And I'm like, yes, You're the one. Yeah. You never let me wrong. <laughs> right, like, right. And so I want, I want that said, person's name, by the way. I just, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a saint. He is, he is a comic book savior. Um, <laughs> he was like, yo, Young Justice though. Like everyone's talking about it, but trust me. The hype, like, the okay. hype, the hype is real. <laughs> yeah. There has to be that person who could verify it for you. Right. It's like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The comic book notar notary. <laughs> I went and I watched, I'm pretty sure I binged the first season like immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing show. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> the, it's because it like like the topic of this particular episode. It's so character driven, yeah. And it goes so much through the experience of here are these individuals. How are they going to to work together? Not so much on the field first. It's like how are we going to start to understand each other so we can get to a point to where we can work with each other? Yes, absolutely. All the intersections of their identities and their backgrounds continuous struggles, having to hide things, show things, whether or not that's the right time for that kind of stuff. Right. I was right. like, this is boss. <laughs> well, this is, and this is, this is what you had, you had said to me when we were having this discussion, you said it's, it's more about the group figuring themselves out as individuals and as a team than it is about what or who they're facing off of against from episode to episode. And I found this to be an interesting parallel to what you were just saying earlier. You're like, okay, so I got blades in the dark. This game is about people facing, facing stresses and, and trauma, and I want to build off that. And then also, I want to have superpowers, right? Yeah. So the foundation of Mutants in the Night is about the characters, who they are, what they're doing. It's not, uh, I mean, hey, I, I, I grew up playing champions. I like super crunchy, all about the powers. <laughs> there's, no, yeah. there's no narrative, <laughs> narrative mechanics <laughs> to champions. Love that mm -hmm. system. But it's about the powers first, and then the story is whatever you want it to be, or whatever you can have it be. And here, Mutants in the Night is the other way around, just like the parallel to what you're describing Young Justice is for you, right? Yeah. That's what's always been most important to me, especially when looking into the history of comics and characters in comics, which continues to be more important to me as, as uh, comics are sort of leaning into that. Yeah. In certain points, they're like, oh, well, this character was made for this reason. Uh, back when I was a teenager, what actually pushed me into hardcore reading comics was Civil War. 
Okay. And that was because up before that point, I would read stories and sometimes I would, I would borrow comics from friends. Like I read, uh, the century in my, in my library, which the, the century. Yeah. I think it was like the 2001 okay. century run that it's, it's beautiful. Such a beautiful it, story. Cent- century is not a well-known Marvel character who is basically their equivalent of Superman, but has a really complicated <laughs> relationship with reality and powers and the Marvel mm-hmm. universe in and of itself. Uh, if you're not familiar with the century, you should check that out, but I'm hand that back to you. Keep going. The century yeah. century was what you read. <laughs> yeah. And wow. read the 2001 one, all the, the newer updated stuff is here and there. Wow. But okay. that whole story is. Yeah. It's intense. Yeah. I'm Superman basically, mm-hmm. but also here's what's going on inside. Yes. And how I have affected the people of this world and their lives. And yeah. I went hot diggity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Absolutely. So my friend introduced me to civil war. And then I saw these ideals clashing against each other on the overlay of these characters. Yeah. And I went, comic books are doing this right now. Yes, they are. Yeah. And then it just, it ran off, you know? Yeah. And so seeing all of that, I'm not surprised that in, in mutants in the night, the whole core is that, like, uh, your powers have, like, two purposes. One purpose is to, because you are, like, a heavily marginalized person, you live in, like, a slum, um, right. to have some kind of control. Uh, you have something that is reliable to you, that always works. When you use a power, whatever it says on the paper is, like, what it does. Yeah. And on the other side is you have this higher level of complication to everything that you do. Because once you have the ability to change things or to act in certain situations, those things weigh on you. The decisions you make are more important. Like it's, it's putting you into that realm of the superhero where it's like, okay, you saved a bunch of people, but you couldn't save everyone. Or, right. uh, maybe you made things worse at one point in time. Or is killing right? Is killing wrong? Like all these sort of things that we can like ask ourselves through that particular lens. And that's the, definite intersection that made like my game a thing yeah so i can't wait i still haven't played it yet i can't wait (laughs) um and also for those of you who remember quinn wilson who is uh one of our most popular discussion guests uh his podcast swells the south their new uh run is apparently going to be mutants in the night so uh make sure to support quinn and, and check that out as well so let's talk let's talk about young justice a little bit so we're talking about character-driven drama and intrigue that also happens to have superpowers. So yeah. what what arcs, either character arcs or overall story arcs, jumped out at you that made you realize, like, oh, this is something different. Like, this is something else. What What is it that grabbed you? There are a couple of characters that immediately stood out to me. I have mixed feelings about Batman, but I'm a huge Robin fan. Uh, I love all the Robins. Good choice. <laughs> Immediately, as soon as they showed up. I have my Nightwing hoodie on today. Was, yeah, I saw. <laughs> I saw earlier. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the first Robin is Dick Grayson because he later turns into... Correct. Um, because then Tim Drake is in the next season. Correct. It was uh, it was Dick, then Jason, then Tim, uh, then Stephanie Brown, and then Damien. Mm-hmm. So one, I've always been a... a Okay, I'm a Tim Drake fan too, but uh, <laughs> I love Tim too. I'm a big fan of Dick Grayson. Yeah, Dick Grayson's whole storyline on his own, even just in in the Batman series, is that weight of like kind of being the the more realistic character, almost fourth wall breaking in a strange way, where everything that goes on with Dick Grayson is like, wait, but I live a real life, right? Like, I'm not this thing that's like, oh, the daytime just happens and then I'm nighttime. <laughs> like, I go Batman. <laughs> Dick Grayson's still Dick Grayson when he's in the Robin suit and going around doing the stuff. And he's still Robin and Dick Grayson when he's going to school during the day, going to college, dating, all that kind of stuff. What a great, what a great, yeah, what a great perspective. This idea that there's always a discussion about, you know, which one is the mask, Bruce or Batman, right? Mm -hmm. But there's never a discussion about whether or not there is a difference. (laughs) There is, that's a given, but not with Mm -hmm. Dick. 
And I think that's a really, really important point. Dick is who he yeah. is either way, whether he's in the costume or not in the costume. And that may reflect on, hopefully, well, I, ideally, I guess, the idea that that's what Bruce wanted in the first place. This kid's traumatized. Let me help him find the people who murdered his parents so he won't end up like me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? It worked out. <laughs> it, it seems to. It seems to have worked out. Yeah. There's lots of different interpretations of their relationship and why Dick left and why he became Nightwing and that kind of thing. But I really, really appreciate the Young Justice version, which mm -hmm. was, which is Bruce letting Dick make that decision. And right. he, Dick being afraid, like, oh, I don't want to tell Batman I don't want to be Batman, where the whole time Bruce is like, no, I did this so you wouldn't be me. But he clearly didn't tell Dick that. He's right. letting Dick have agency in the choice that he makes, you know? And I think that's that agency thing is so important in any storytelling, right? But is is so prominent in Young Justice, allowing yeah. characters to not just be saved off the railroad tracks, you know what I mean, by other people, letting them make those decisions, even the really hard, painful ones mm -hmm. that have consequences like you're talking about in Mutants in the Night, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Dick Grayson's always a, once Dick's there, I'm like, all right, all right, I'm watching who's around him. <laughs> and it wasn't like, oh, this is going to be Dick Grayson and squad. Right. Um, it was, all right, here's this character that, you know, and here's some ones that are a bit new and then some familiar ones. Aquaman, Aqualad, like, totally, totally caught me. You have a black character, Mask, like, super awesome with the water swords. I'm like, oof, okay. You Right off the bat, the look, I was like, okay, well, there's another character that I love. But Aqualad, he has one of those. Aqualad is ridiculous. They and yeah. For a character that, when they when people tend to introduce characters into a show that's never existed before, I'm always skeptical. But the, uh -huh. the original Aqualad was challenging i've said it on the show challenging to get behind garth mm -hmm. um aqua aqua lad needed a revamp and they revamped him from head to toe in a way that made him very quickly my second favorite behind dick grayson yeah. in this show he's incredible he he was in that area where it's like oh the kind of more stoic and reasonable sort of trope yeah but like they all start in in a place and very quickly explore that place so it was like okay i see what they're doing with aqualad he's kind of a, a nice centered person and then um mcgann she definitely was super interesting to me as well because me and me and my friend who i was talking about who does all the design stuff we we have this uh mutual agreement that martian manhunter is widely underpowered in the comics because he can do things like with his skill set, it's like you should be like the most powerful or second most powerful character. Yes. <laughs> like and McGann was like a more raw when it comes to to powers, like a more raw version. Here's the process of like learning and discovering. Yes. But then also a girl. Yes. And so I was like, okay, so we had this whole uh like man discovering how to be a man as a human. And now we have this girl who is who has been super excited to enter human life and has been like a choice thing. Like, oh, I'm so ready to do this. Yeah. And then has to face the reality of what that means. And I feel like there's a lot of places there to uh, inspect when somebody has like issues or confrontations with their identity, their perceived identity and what's real and yeah. finding out where those two things clash. Mm -hmm. And she's a great example of that as because her, her conflicts are all based in herself and that perception and how she feels about herself reflect off of other people, how she feels about herself based on her powers, her, her like true form versus the form that she presents. And uh, those struggles are so close to the LGBTQ plus community mm -hmm. uh, that, it's really easy to go like, oh, wow. Yeah, she's, for one, that's very teenager. And for two, like, you're touching on some things that like, specific marginalized people experience a lot yeah. um, with visibility and how you look, um, which I also put in my game. Uh, I'm telling you, subconscious influence is probably for all of this stuff. No, it's fantastic. You're taking the thing, all of these things, as you're talking about you and your experiences, uh, this is what I this is why I like to try and tell people like we all have these things inside of us. There's a unique story that's you, 
find a way if you want to, if you're a creative person, find a way to express those things. You're taking those experiences, those keys that you've picked up in your life, and you're un unlocking something like Mutants in the Night that's clearly resonating with people. Um, and, and as you were talking about Miss Martian, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we, we had Sophia Soderstrand on the show, uh, mm -hmm. and we did a deep dive on Miss Martian, um, shape changing, spirituality, the concept of Miss Martian being less an, an, an analog necessarily to the trans experience and more a power fantasy for the trans experience. We went into that in depth nice. with her. Uh, it, it was, it was fantastic. And so it, I, and of course, Quinn talking about the ideas of identity versus personality and the evolution of those things in the hand of Miss Martian. Miss Martian is such a brilliant character to discuss, so deep as a character. She's real good. <laughs> yeah, but but what's what's crazy to me is this idea that she's not the only one. Yeah, like Superboy's growth and change. Oh, um, I love Superboy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Superboy takes on the, this is one of my favorite uh, like story arcs that I'm that I'm really enjoying that people are doing these days. Um I don't do you watch My Hero Academia? Uh, I don't. I hear amazing things though. Okay, so Superboy is in My Hero Academia, but like turned up to 11. Okay. Because there's this character that's not turned up to are, 11 already. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. <laughs> let me tell you. For the listeners at home, they're nodding like, "Yep. Yeah." <laughs> <That's> <laughs> All right, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> uh in My Hero Academia, there's this character who is always yelling and is like always like violent and is like, I'm a superhero. Like, and everyone's like, you, you act kind of like a villain. And he's like, I'm going to beat you up. If you say that again, like he's that kind of person. But and this is kind of the reflection I see in Superboy, but definitely toned down a little bit that we have these characters who are boys and teenagers who don't know how to express themselves except for, in a way that is heavily masculine by society standards. Yeah. And so they're not good at communicating and the ways that they end up communicating aren't clear. And people like are start to understand around them that it's like, Oh, it's not just, you're not like trying to be abusive. It's that you don't understand another way. Yeah. And you're going through the process of finally having an environment that lets you understand in different ways and people that reflect back to you. That it's like, I know you're not trying to be violent. I know that you're not trying to like shut people down. It's that instead you're trying to connect with people, but you don't know how. Yeah. And Superboy is like, oof, that hits me right in the heart. Yeah. Because you have Superman out there. Like super imagine if, if your parent was Superman. And they didn't know you existed. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, well, uh, I have this to live up to. The most liked character ever who can do anything, who everyone's like, this is the greatest person I know, right? Yeah. And you're just like, you pop out and you're like, what's up? <laughs> I'm like 13 or like two, I guess. <laughs> right. And <laughs> I am nothing like this person in, in my own qualities. I'm my own person, except for right. I look like that person. Right. I can't do all the or things there's, that they can Or there's do. very specific like bullet point comparisons. Oh, you can't fly. Oh, you right. don't have heat vision. Oh, you don't. It's always like, what can't you do? Instead like, what do, you can. like, like Kid Flash, you can still jump over buildings in a single bound. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> but other people can't help but make those comparisons. So even if you're, even if the bar, the bar that, that you're already achieving is, is so high when you or other people around you, particularly you, but other people mm -hmm. around you as well, keeps, keep moving the bar or set the bar so much higher. It's so hard to accept yourself as who you are. And that arc of Superboy, like, am I a weapon or a hero is the choice he's given, but it takes him, it takes him a while to figure out, wait a minute, number one, I, I don't, uh, understanding, okay, I was given this choice. Am I, I'm going to be either a weapon or a hero, but he took him a while to figure out, wait, that, that dichotomy was also handed to me. Yeah. Like, and I don't have to accept any of that. I don't have to be a weapon or an anything. I can just be me and what I'm going to be. And that arc, particularly to see him in the third season where he's now having to mentor Breon, deal and go like, okay, yep, all right, man, I'm having to eat crow right now because it's like, <laughs> I, this is totally what I was two seasons ago. I, oh, uh -huh. okay, I got, I got this, guys. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's incredible. It's great because I think those that those are the kinds of stories that young men need right now. I agree. Is to say, here's the way that the society taught me how to be. Here's what like a quote unquote perfect man looks like. And then people either expect me to completely reject that and be like, oh, well, I don't care and yada, yada. And like there, it's easy to manipulate that kind of person that hasn't investigated themselves. And then there are people who try and be perfect and are going to fall short because it doesn't exist. Yeah. And then there's that other point where, just like you said, the show is continuously bringing up these great things. You can be whatever you want to be. You can be yourself. And the people around you who really care about you are going to support that. Yeah. You don't have to worry. Like if you have those people around you, you can even go onto the world, find other people who like, right. Love you for who you are. I think that's why the, uh, or the sphere. Right. Oh, sphere. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they hit it off. Cause it's like, well, there's no judgment here. We're just, we're me and you. <laughs> it's, it's such a simple relationship. Right. This is a thing that, uh, uh, Emily pointed out this idea in the third season where Superboy is fixing motorcycles for a living. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, she's like, this is just the perfect Superboy <laughs> adopting and helping broken things. And I'm just, I just started tearing up. I'm just like, just yeah. that simple idea of him. I'm just expressing who I am through these things. You know what I mean? You could look at that so and go good. like, you could look at it and go like, Oh, well, that's very macho of him fixing right. motorcycles or whatever. But you know him. You know more about his journey and what that is, exactly. right? Exactly. And the healthy, the, they, you know, Super Superboy and Miss Martian obviously go through um, serious problems with um, abuse and manipulation in the second season, and mm -hmm. then that evolution, you know, moves forward. And when we see them in the third season addressing those issues and and expressing, like you're saying, like like seeing these male figures. Um, like Dick Grayson, right? A very yeah. non-toxically masculine character. He's always been that way. And seeing Superboy doing these same things and finding better ways to express himself while allowing himself to fully be himself as well. Yeah. And then seeing Martian, or Miss Martian and Superboy discussing the, the everyday challenges of a relationship. Not just the, let's just show the dramatic romantic high and low points and somebody's going to cheat on somebody. And what. No, let's talk about... How Miss Martian's like, I get that this is important, but we had an agreement about home was home and the watchtowers for missions. And he yeah. and Superboy saying, You are one hundred percent right. Let's work this out. And I'm like, thank that's what I want my kids to see. Thank, yes. thank you. Thank you for showing something. Do they have problems? Is it is there drama? Yes. Can we also show mm. healthy discussions of relationships without people making all these like pulling the first cliche out of the out of the cliche trunk? Of like, oh, we're going to be jealous and not talk and hide secrets. And yeah. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the time when comics and these shows, they have the long-term relationship couple that just last. They never show how that works. Right. And how that is achieved. Right. And this show is like, let's start from the beginning and <laughs> move it all the way over. Right. So that when you start from the beginning, you can see yeah. and kind of reflect off of, this is how this works. This is how you sustain a relationship. It's pretty unusual for me to run into somebody that I know that's been together for a decade or more where they're like, nope, it's been great the whole time. There's usually been yeah. like, well, about year six, we were going to kill each other, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it was terrible. And then, but we worked through it and we wanted to work through it and we chose to work through it and we did. And now we're, now we figured stuff out better about ourselves. And that's the way long-term relationships tend to work. It's not like, you know, the happily ever after without the explanation of what happens next. So yeah. that, that underlying thing, and we haven't brought up a single power in any of these conversations, <laughs> right? And ostensibly, this is a show about DC comic superheroes doing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, uh, we, I mean I, I, we can even talk about the idea of character expression through combat because you see yeah. these fight scenes and you see characters evolve and change their fight styles being differently, but how they work together as a team differently, particularly in the early of season one as well. And representing, representing how they change and how they understand each other. Watching Superboy get so angry at Black Canary, trying to train him. And then seeing oh, him yeah. at the beginning of season three, where he steps into a fight with a guy who's at least as strong as he is and drops mm -hmm. 
in a heartbeat because you see him go into a fighting stance and hit him in like the kidney and the throat and under the armpit <laughs> and then down he goes and you're just like, oh, yes. Black Canary all over. All, all <laughs> the way. I'm like, you get Superman, <laughs> Superboy's strength and with Black Canary's combat style. Bye bye, buddy. You're out of mm-hmm. here, right? <laughs> but seeing that, that is an expression of character as well as an expression of something like action superhero oriented that I think is so key and important. And again, this is an ensemble cast. So it's not just a single character that they're doing this with. It's across the board. Watching Artemis grow from a broken home, from an abusive, mm-hmm. terrible environment she grew up with, the loss of a sister, you know, like, and then going all the way into season three where she's uh, being so nurturing and caring and adopting and helping Halo and doing all these things is who she is as an expressed person, you know? Yeah, they they really went into, let's take all of these these different places of life that we come from, mash them all together, because that's what happens when you're a teenager. You're thrown into a room with a bunch of people who are completely different than you, are very much like you, and you have no idea, Yeah, and make it work. And uh, a lot of people end up running into those places where it's like, okay, well, we're friends or we're teammates or we need to make this work. So let's kind of dive into your past and how like the abuse in your life has made it so that we have a trust issue here. And we, we kind of have to dive into a little bit of that if we're going to continue on in this relationship and how each one of them, even if they're not like the direct companion, they have support and people to bounce off of that have a lot of different experiences. And that's really helpful to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. So that trust, that cohesion, like you said, reflects back onto like the way that they do combat, the way that they end up mentoring like these other kids. Yeah. It's beautiful to see that uh, all of the, there's this, this passing down of sort of trust that comes from most of them being the like quote unquote sidekick of a super prominent hero. It's like, y'all don't have to be us. And that's what we're trying to establish to you. Right. To be yourselves, do what we didn't. Right. And be together. Yeah. Reflect off of one another. Don't just be an idea of something. Like you can be a person and a hero and whatever else you want to be. Yeah. It's real powerful stuff. It, it, I, I agree with you. Um, and I think the watchers clearly agree with, <laughs> with you as well, <laughs> as well as third season's doing. I want to, uh, be- before we wrap too much up, I want to, I want to bring it this back a little bit to, um, mutants in the night mm-hmm. and how all of this, this clear passion that you have for this kind of storytelling and this kind of character driven drama and this kind of importance for people's personal experiences, um, being represented, how this kind of reflects itself in this, this game that you want people to sit down around the table and tell a cooperative story sharing these experiences with. Can you can you reflect back on Mutants in the Night and kind of both how how you're bringing that to bear and how you're using mechanics in some way as well to help people feel comfortable sharing these experiences and with each other? Yeah, I actually do most of this, <laughs> the stuff that we talked about. One of the things that I really love about my game is that the core of it comes down to two parts. It's the culture that that you create that is built off of like the little key points that I hand out. And then it is the creation because I established that people get to create their own city. There's uh, the core things that need to be in there, the five different locations where you go and you get your jobs to play the game. But we established that it's a real place that has real things. It has sports, it has fashion, it has uh, places to hang out. It has these different groups that exist and how they work with and around each other all these different perspectives and it's not really about the world outside nearly as much. It's about who do you, who are you and the world that you create around yourself. You're not forced into a place, even though you're technically being forced into a place, a walled city, it's your walled city. And once you establish like the place around you and how different people end up coming together there, how the different cultures have adopted each other and different things, then you get to choose what you're like, like what's your mutation? What do you look like? What, how does uh, who you are present outwardly? Is it something that is it's super out there and, and people can then really notice it? And does it affect like how people treat you in different spaces? Is it something that you can hide? Is it something that's easy to manipulate? Is it something you're really proud of or not? And then I get into the ways that people 
end up uh, taking care of themselves. I still call vices from Blades in the Dark vices in my game, but they're really self-care practices. And I take away the weight of them being uh, like taboo. So, uh, for example, when people bring up like drinking in a game, they'll be like, oh, well, you like overdid it and everything. But And that's a thing that exists, and it's important to bring that up. But also, there are people who have long 12, 14, 16-hour days and unwind by going to the bar, having a beer or two with a friend, walking home, and, you know, they have a healthy relationship with that thing. Yes. It's not, it's not bad to do that. It's okay. And that connection that people have with hanging out with other people in those spaces can be really important. You can go party on the weekends and still be a healthy person. You can, it's like, Hey, well, you've been cooped up inside and maybe you need to need to go get some social energy and like yeah. meet up with some people, yeah. either have some good conversations, get lost in the music. Uh, there's a lot of different things where the core is not what you're doing, but why you're doing it. Yeah. I hear Once you. people understand why they are doing the actions that they're doing, what they get out of those experiences that draws in a lot more of, okay, this is what my character is kind of about. This is what they need. And so if they need this, yeah, what are they that. dealing with? I love that. that. They need that for, and it connects into, you have friends that you, you like hang out with, do these things, unless you're doing like a solo activity. Um, and you have your community who, because it's pretty tight knit immediately ties into, oh, well, these people work in these different places. These people are your rivals because maybe you're not rivals and like you're really aggressive against each other, but maybe you compete against each other in a thing because your thing is competition. Um, there's a lot of elements to making it so that your entire experience goes, here I am and here's what's different about me, but I am surrounded by other people who are ex experiencing something similar. And that's where you start off. It sounds to me like you're using the, the cooperative aspect of the game isn't just about I'm creating a character and dropping it into a world. It sounds mm -hmm. like you're using that energy of cooperative storytelling to create a living space. Yes. Like yes. A, a, a living environment, not one that's just a place you go do things in, Yeah, but it's a place where you exist in. We're doing this uh, something similar in some ways in Descent into Midnight with our game as well, with this cooperative creating a, a city. With, with us, it's a... It's an already an alien environment because we have you on another world in an ocean underwater and you're playing non-human alien fish creatures, right? So like we, we're kind of like, we'll let people decide how much they know or don't know and what they want to share about the underwater world. You're taught, you, this is a thing that people can very directly relate to, right? You are creating a city. You're creating a place. You're creating a living environment and who your characters are are reflected by the space they're in and the space they're in is reflected in the characters as well. I think that's so important, is creating a world. Because in, in Young Justice, they do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like the, these sidekicks, you could do a show with these sidekicks in a vacuum, but they don't. It's, the, it's literally the entire galaxy that takes up the DC universe and their mm -hmm. reflection inside that, right? Their, their comparison, as, you're, as you were alluding to earlier, the Superboy versus Superman matters more because Superman exists. Like, exactly. And it sounds like you're doing that, incorporating that into the actual, like what we call session zero or early sessions of, of creating this game that you're going to play around the table, right? Yeah. There's a lot of making it, asking the questions that make things real. Yeah. And so it's, what is the art like? What are the sports like? What's the fashion like? How do people feel about things? And where is this place? What does that, how does that affect the culture? Because before you even get into yourself, like you build in how everything around you, I really just move the scope down and I go, here's some things and answer these questions. Now you're here. Right. And people make the most amazing, fantastic things that like, it blows me away every single time. Yeah. I, I feel you and I can't wait to play. It just, it sounds, You're gonna have it just sounds, it sounds incredible. So thanks so much for spending some time with us in the Watchtower DC. Where can people find you uh, out here on Earth Prime? Uh, you can find me on just about anything as Dungeon Commander with no E in Commander. That would be Twitch, Twitter, Patreon, Ko-Fi, just about anywhere else. If you randomly type into a game you play Dungeon Commander, add me. Uh, that's me. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs>
We'll have links uh, and such to some of the things we were talking about as well uh, down in the show notes. And thanks to everyone else for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. And you can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find our show. If you do leave us a, a rating or review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the United States. We have a, to look a little harder to find some of those. If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.